here is Our Power Sunday. It's our weekly bike rides that we host for the community. We are in, literally in the heart of Richmond. Downtown Richmond is the, the dead center of, what, of where all the main activity takes place. Um, if it's from the street level to the city level. Um, everything happens here, right here on McDonald. And all of the issues from the good things to the bad things, it, it meets up here, right in front of our bike shop. You don't see a lot of black people from the hood coming out and riding bikes to show them that we can do it too, you know? Riding through these particular parks and neighborhoods, it helps defeat that idea of what shadows our entire city. And this idea is, it's always dangerous, always dirty, threatening. So us riding our bikes through that park, you know, it changes people's views, it changes people's perceptions. We had an altercation with the police detaining an individual for whatever reason. Police was immediately swarmed him before any conversation or questions could actually take place. Logically, the police were doing their job to obtain an individual who may have potentially caused harm. But as staff, I don't want my participants to be intimidated. I actually spoke out and spoke to the police to let them know that this is our street this is our community we do things here with peace that is with unity that is with full communication and full understanding we have our way of policing our community and the paid police have their way of policing our community you didn't see for my enemies everybody want to talk yeah. i was a nigga that's really just moving around up on the top yeah. hey. everybody want to keep on talking like they with me but you know they not yeah. hey. i'm gonna just keep on this flipping that shit and i get it i never flop yo hey. i'm getting it fast i get in this slow what you want i'm looking at that shit but you know i know that you don't you say that you the shooter bounce out the whip and you froze but it's Okay, cause you know that everybody gonna know. I don't need to use no gun, I need to use my mouth. I need to just let all y'all people know what I'm about. I'm a young black man growing up in the rich. I remember all them times when people was getting put in the dish. Still happening, now I'm really tired and I'm trying to keep going. Like my said, with my breath, I'm finna keep flowing. Now I'm finna yell it loud, I'm finna really scream it. Check it out, boy, I ain't never really been no demon. At one point, you didn't even see no bike riders out here. Now that you do, you see a lot of them. It's like, let's have more. Let's let's bring our community, our Richmond, out into the world and say, hey, we, us Richmond riders, we can do it too. Richmond is like, it seems cool, but there's really not enough stuff for you. Um, especially for like, um, youth of color. And it's really cool to have like a whole melting pot of experiences and wheels and, um, fun and things like that. It's a sense of community, but we met each other here on the actual rides. I know for myself, they rode down the street that I was on and I'm like, where's everybody going? And so that's how you found out about it. And then I started riding with them and I've been riding with them ever since. It gets you a chance to know and get to meet who's in your community where we actually wouldn't probably just go out and start talking to people. I wouldn't, I know I wouldn't. All of us here, we know each other just from riding and seeing each other and just wanting to build a bigger community. And a community is family and it takes a village really to raise our children. So this is where I get that support and that family. The Richmond population is about 110,000. Latinos are about 40%. African Americans are about 22% and declining. Asians are around 15%, but that's an incredibly diverse population. Chinese, sick Laotian refugee community that came here at the end of the Vietnam War. Communities of color living here deal with local pollution. There's coal trains, there's so much industrial pollution. We're trying to organize a movement of movements where we can holistically transform um, our reality, the way we're governed, the way we govern ourselves, the way we choose to be in community with each other, our relationships to industries and practices, to rethink and reimagine all those aspects. Together, we are trying to advance what's called a just transition in Richmond. As we talk about the just transition, which really emerged out of the labor community, knowing that uh, industries like uh, oil, are, you know, were facing obsolescence. And so what were their people gonna do when their jobs get phased out? But it's also now been incorporated into the broader climate change and environmental justice movement because when these companies shut down, they're gonna leave a tremendous legacy of pollution. Does that mean we get stuck holding the bag even though we've never gotten the benefits? So uh, we want to be able to set a framework, what we call the Just Transition Framework, where there's a planned transition in our economy, here in Richmond, led by people who live here in Richmond so that they actually benefit from that transition. We can't talk about a just transition without talking about the extractive economy of mass incarceration. Literally, bodies, people as a resource 
to that system. The Safe Return Project mission is to end mass incarceration of black people and people of color and re-enfranchise individuals and communities that have been disenfranchised as a result of the carceral state. I'm formerly incarcerated, I'm the director. Our organizers are formerly incarcerated. Between 1980 and 1995, we built more prisons in California than we had from 1850 to 1980. These people are extracting human beings who can be productive folks in our community, taking them out and putting them somewhere away from our community and making money off of their bodies. They offer some of these people the opportunity to get out by paying them super sub minimum wage to go out there on the front lines fighting fires. So it's essentially like slave labor. We understand that to be part of the overall uh, extractive economy. It's not just about mining and oil drilling and that sort of thing, uh, people are extracted as well. When we started organizing eight years ago, our recidivism rate was 73% higher than the national average. It was mostly because communities were under-resourced before they were even incarcerated. And then if you return home and you want to do something different, now you have all these barriers. You're not really a full citizen. So you, your voting rights are stripped away. You can't access job opportunities. We have accomplished a lot as an organization. We have passed policies making it illegal to ask people about their criminal histories and employment and housing. We have also been able to continuously defeat the expansion of jails. We have been able to divert millions of dollars into resources in this county for people returning from jails and prisons that didn't exist eight years ago. This is near the port of Richmond and one of the most um, environmentally hazardous areas in the city of Richmond. Uh, to the left, the big white tanks are operated by Plains All-America and the oil company who had the ruptured pipeline in Santa Barbara uh, about two years ago. And uh, that was feeding the San Luis Obispo refinery. And over on the right is the CMEX cement plant, one of the most toxic industries that we do have. This is a Richmond uh, Pacific Rail car. This is the company that hauls the coal trains. And that blue unit right to your left, right in the center there, that is where the conveyor belt that hauls both the coal and the petroleum coke off the coal trains into ships that then take it to China and or to uh, Mexico where they burn it as energy fuel. Petroleum coke is too toxic to be allowed over here as energy fuel, but they allow it to be burned in the refineries and then they ship it to other countries that with less stringent environmental rules. And coming up on the right is Sims Metals Corporation. It's a huge international metal corporation based in Australia. They view this as a recycling operation, but the casual way in which they operate this facility caused a major fire that released dioxins in the community, which is cancer causing and was the real dangerous element within Agent Orange. Chevron is the single largest private sector employer. Its uh, property taxes and other taxes represent about a quarter of the city of Richmond's annual budget, which is about $125 million. But and it only hires about 5% local people. Very few Latinos and African Americans get those jobs. As a redlining practice back um, in the early 50s, you had policies and people in positions of power still operating under racist values, literally drawing a red line for communities of color to live, to live next to industrial polluted sources that they later call brownfields, and then to also not give any resources. Almost every single person in the Laotian community who live here in Richmond when they die, the doctor said that I have cancer, and some people have kidney failure, and a lot of kids have asthma. My friends, they were born here, grew up here, lived here, went to school here, and worked here. I lost almost 50. And when we went to talk about Chevron expanding, there was a woman from the library that said 12 people, 12 librarians died from cancer, and all of us believe it's because of the pollution Chevron was putting in our water and in the environment. When Chevron expulsion here, uh, 2012, sent 15,000 people in the hospital seeking for treatment, right? So who 
the people of Richmond. The people who run the Chevron, they're over there in San Ramon. They're not here. This is a two-part mural put together by a group called Water Rights. This side of it is telling the story of how railroads are involved in the uh, transport of oil and the threat that it presented here to this community. It starts with the macaw and some tropical foliage representing the Amazon where Chevron has helped destroy part of the Amazon and poison many of the indigenous people and their water down there. It also shows the shoreline where there's been a number of disasters involving oil trains. Then it shows the Long Wharf, which is where Chevron gets its oil here in Richmond. It's right in the bay. Chevron gets 80% of its oil from the Persian Gulf, which is why we had the war over there to steal their oil. And then this oil train represents the threat of crude by rail, which they were trying to bring from North Dakota and from Tar Sands, Alberta, Canada. For many years, we fought projects anywhere along the rail line that put Richmond at risk and finally stopped all of those projects. So now they're going to plan B. They're trying to expand the wharfs out here in the bay and more than double the amount of tankers. We know that this is exacerbating the climate situation. So this is one way where we can interfere with that economy by stopping the transport, therefore stopping the processing. Sunflower actually helps absorb toxins out of the soil. So we thought that was a pretty good symbol of our resilience. The other side of the mural represents transitioning. It's a representation of the Greenway, which is a former railroad right-of-way that has now been turned into a bicycle and pedestrian path with a bunch of community gardens, ethnic gardens, and park facilities. This was indigenous people's lands prior to the European invasion and genocide. It's something for us to all remember. Everybody here is an immigrant. This is Unity Park. On the Richmond Greenway, we're activating parks that has been revamped, newly implemented, has been there for years, historic parks, different monumental parks. This park has been advocated for and for, uh, for many, many years, but has been neglected due to the city and the, and the county itself. This year has been opened up to the public, for the community, for our kids, and it's such a beautiful park. It's literally what we've been waiting for for all these years of advocating for it. Chevron has been in Richmond for over 100 years. In the last 100 years, they've been contaminating everything in terms of the pollution, in terms of the politics around here in Richmond. We had candidates who basically, you know, passed policies, you know, that Chevron preferred to be passed. No matter how much protesting you did, it was to no avail unless the people who were in office made the right decisions. So we figured that the best way to have people make the right decisions was to put the right people into the office. Folks coming together like the Richmond Progressive Alliance over 15, 16 years ago, saying we don't take any corporate donations and we want to fight for increased wages, better housing protection, more affordable housing, ensuring that we're environmentally safe, ensuring that our communities are healthy and thriving, and getting big money out of politics, that resonated with people. When we organized and we mobilized and we unified as a community, we went from a corporate majority to now having a majority, a corporate free majority on the Richmond City Council. Boy, did they use their money and resources to block this from happening. In 2014, this corporation inserted $3 million into a Richmond City Council race. Now, that's a lot of money for any race, let alone a small city council race. Every single mailbox, every day was getting stuffed with three to four flyers. Every single billboard was taken up. If you were on your phone, you were going to run into a Chevron message. If you were on watching TV, you were going to run into a Chevron message. Richmond Police Association worked hand in hand with Chevron to create negative information. They say that 
I can't do a budget. I'm a job killer. I'm an anarchist. I don't show up for work. The other part of what they did had to do with lots of money and support and resources to nonprofits. In order for them to take Chevron's money, they had to agree to not talk badly about the company. In the face of that, the RPA coalition with several other organizations knocked on doors and formed voters. Voters began recognizing that we should have leaders that don't take corporate money. They didn't win any of the people that they promoted. The next election, they basically disappeared. We're now seeing our city has improved uh, dramatically. Crime is down since we changed the model that allowed a lot of bad cops on the force to a model now that we call community policing. We have the highest minimum wage in the state, $15 an hour next year. We have rent controlled for the first time in 30 years, as well as more transparency and accountability from Chevron Corporation. We demanded that they pay their fair share of taxes, and now we have the resources that we need to feel hopeful. We were able to get a large solar farm built on Chevron property. It's the largest public-owned solar program in the Bay Area, yeah. I think the settlement wasn't enough. It is not a win. They would have to pay the medical cost of every Richmond resident for the rest of their life and their kids and their kids after their kids and their kids after their kids, and they still wouldn't be able to make up for all the health disparities and devastation that they caused our community. All right, and we will be entering the Buna Marina Bay community. This here is like another country inside of Richmond. It's segregated. It's away from everything. One of the most beautiful tourist spots here in Richmond. We will be coming into a very, very naturey environment. We have baby ducks, baby geese, a bunch of baby animals. So we will be walking our bikes through this path here. Please take this opportunity to take photos, sightseeing. Because of gentrification pressures in San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, um, educated white folks with money are now starting to move in and it's driving prices up. Gentrification has pushed us away from our communities where our jobs and our resources are. Now we have to commute. Public transportation is almost unaffordable for the people who it was created for. The pollution is becoming a horrible health issue. The goal is to clear out the, uh, the poor people and bring in the wealthy people. If you go down to the marina, they're clearing the land, they're getting ready to make apartments there because they're planning a ferry that will come from the marina to San Francisco, trying to entice the people with money to come over here. We have close to a thousand people on the streets every night. They can't be in the park, they can't be on a bench, they can't be in a doorway. They get arrested, and if they get arrested so many times, they're going to go to jail, and from jail to prison. Because there's such limited services, if they get there and they turn them away, they can't go somewhere else to eat. We need a safe park. The city has lots of property they're not using. Then the services can come to them. Then they can get a good night's sleep and be able to think clearly and make decisions about their life. Refurbish the buildings up and down our streets that have been left empty so that they become part of our community. I don't want them in a little place where we everybody can say, oh, those are the homeless people. Back in 2015, ACE was working with a building full of tenants that received a 20% increase on their rent. We organized the entire building to fight against the rent increase, but also fight for the repairs that they needed, and things started to get fixed, and we did rent strikes to send out a message that this is an unfair increase. A lot of folks were getting rent increases from $50 to about $600, sometimes double the original rent. As of 2016, we passed rent control and just cause for eviction. Now we're taking it up to the state level by repealing a state law called Costa Hawkins. That puts a limitation on rent control because rent control, you can only cover multifamily unit buildings built before 1995. We gathered over 600,000 signatures to repeal Costa Hawkins and that's gonna be on the November ballot and we're gonna make sure people get out to vote for that. There are lots we can do um, with regard to land use. One of the things we've been fighting for in Richmond is more affordable housing, but state laws supersede city laws. As a city, you know, as a municipality, we are not the ones to determine the definition of affordability. California, you know, supposedly one of the most progressive states, allows refining pollution to increase so long as the industry is willing to pay. 
trying to address climate change through a market-based mechanism. Bay Area frontline community members had a solution and it was to cap refinery pollution at the levels that they are today and to start reducing pollution over time. That was met with significant resistance from the oil industry, but also from our own government. The governor would not allow local air regulators to regulate air quality. And that local agency was about to pass rules to cap refinery pollution that would then protect the local community. You're talking about a state agency taking power away from a local agency. That's why all the more we need to have representatives at state level who are not beholden to these corporations who put people over profits. Great city ride. Great city ride. Great city ride. Great city ride. Can we get a oh yeah. Oh yeah. The Richmond Marina Park, the World War II Rosie the River workers built World War II ships here. Right in front of us here, you have some monument rock pillars, basically acknowledging the Chinese workers that were told to work their portion of the ships in this exact bay. A lot of people tend to go to the more populated areas, which is like San Francisco or the, you know, the Berkeley Marina, but this is a beautiful place right here. And it's really nice and um, clean. We cannot just sit here and complain about Chevron. We have to find new solution and new alternative. We don't want the big corporation to take the, all the solar program. If the Richmond community here can own their own solar and can serve them, their people here as more local produce, more, more local use, and more local sustainable, and that is a very important key for the, the just transition frame. The city of Richmond has joined uh, other cities and counties in a lawsuit against the petrochemical corporations for knowingly contributing to sea level rise. Fossil fuels are on the way out and so Chevron needs to be thinking of ways to retrain their employees to move on to, to, to other jobs. The just transition, we have to look into the policy while they are doing production right now. The profits Chevron make to contribute to the roping job skill. When we challenged a system of incarceration, people saw it as challenging their jobs. Look at all of the jobs that aren't being done. The jobs we haven't imagined yet that we actually need, that people could do. A just transition is needed. So how do you do that? Well, you don't have legislators who think they have all the answers. And so for me, that's why it's so important to collaborate with organizations that are doing the work. We have Urban Tail, they're farmers, helping to reduce climate change and teaching how to grow our own food locally. We decided to host a big town gathering. We called it the Richmond People's Assembly. The People's Assembly just look at like, what is our common ground here? What is our common goal here? Before the assembly happened, there was a huge effort to survey and talk to hundreds of Richmond residents about what their top priority issues were. And it was also really exciting to hear a lot of people of color and black people talk about pollution, talk about healthy food, and, and the things that people don't think we care about. We can come together to collectively leverage our power and then have solutions that are centered in our frontline community members. Now the follow-up. How do we organize? And how do we now use this resource of all these new people? How do we move a community into what we see locally as Richmond, as the best just transition for all of us? Mm -hmm.